uh, quantum mechanics. So this is going to be the last class of this quantum mechanics uh, course. And today we are going to be uh, talking about harmonic oscillator using uh, what is known as the ladder approach, ladder operator, okay? So before we do that, do we have any questions from previous time? Yes, sir. There was a diagram with finite potential and you yeah, uh, yeah. you assumed two scenarios, one with A is equal to zero and B is equal oh. to zero. So could you please explain why A is equal to zero and B is equal to zero gives such a uh, leak out of the vect uh, potential while, I mean... Okay, well, okay, was it this potential, the one which was... Uh, like this? Yes, finite. Uh, no, uh, sorry, the sorry. two walls were on L by 2 side and oh, the wave okay. function was slightly exponentially decaying after the Right, wall. so the, the potential was like this. Yes, sir. Right? Yeah, okay. So, you know, this can, so this is another, uh, so this is X and, or maybe, you know, we can just take this to be X. Hmm. And this is say minus V naught. Hmm. So this is our potential. Now there are two scenarios in one, say the total, um, energy of the particle is positive. And another scenario where the total energy of the particle is negative, right? So this is the one we are interested in. Okay, so if I look at what the Schrodinger equation is for this system, so what do I get? So I have two regions, three regions, region one, region two, and region three. So we are looking at, uh, we are trying to solve the Schrodinger equation, but for energy, negative. Okay, is that clear? Yes, sir. So if I look, if I can rewrite Schrodinger equation, the time independent Schrodinger equation in this form. So I had minus h squared by 2m, now it'll come over here, 2m by h squared, and there's a minus sign. And, and on this side, we had, uh, we had an E. So the E will be here. And there will be a V of psi. Uh, I think, uh, no. Yeah, right? So this is going to be our Schrodinger equation. So the signs here are very important. So let me make sure that I don't make a mistake here. Okay. So here we see that in region one, you know, um, so you, 2m by h squared e minus v, this thing is uh, negative, right? Yes, sir. And and the same in region, uh, region three. Okay, so in these regions, I can write this equation as d squared, d, d squared psi dx squared is equal to uh, k1 squared psi, where k1 squared is, um, 2m by h squared v minus e, okay? Now, so this is in region two and three. Now, if I ask you the question, you know, what is the solution to this equation? What are the linearly independent solution to this equation? What would, you, what would be your answer? Exp uh, e to the power i Kx. Okay, so if I say e to the power i, say k1 of x, 
If I take the second derivative of this thing, say d squared x, I actually get the wrong side, okay? Right, because i squared gives me minus sign. Okay. Yes, sir. So the solution to this equation is not this. The solution to this equation is actually. Um, can you guess? It's plus minus. Okay. 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 On the other hand, if I look at the equation in region two, in region two. My equation is d squared psi dx squared is equal to minus k squared of psi, where k squared is 2m by h. So, sorry, this should be. Um, so, okay, uh, I made a slight mistake because we, we assume that the, this is zero, okay? So v not v is zero there, okay? But you know, still everything holds. Um, so then, what we have is that it's going to be um, two m uh, h squared. Sorry, um, h squared uh, v not minus e, right? And then we are going to have, is that correct? Right, because this minus sign, minus sign, uh, or should there be a minus sign? No, I think it's, it's, it's right here, yeah. Uh, hmm? No, no, I think it's the other way around, okay. Uh, so in that region, yeah, sorry, in that region, uh, e is greater than v naught, right? So we yeah, have sorry. It should be e minus v naught, right? Right. Sorry. Okay. So now, if I look at what are the, I ask you, what is the solution to this equation? I'm just taking care to make sure that k is a positive number. K plus k one is also sorry a real number. K one is also a real number. So here, the solution would be e to the power plus minus i of k of x. Okay, so that's why here we have an oscillatory solution. And here we can have a like a, a exponentially decaying solution or an exponentially increasing solution, right? But we reject exponentially increasing solutions because we are expecting that our particle be bounded, be bound in a finite region. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Any other questions? Yeah, actually another, uh, and it's related to, you said something like psi double prime is uh, infinitely uh, discontinuous, then psi prime is finitely discontinuous and psi is continuous, something like this, the three yeah, yeah. relation. So yeah, it's, does that that's have from, any physical significance? Yeah. Uh, well, it, it has significance in terms of solving the Schrodinger equation. Okay? Because, and of course that does have physical significance because that was relevant for the case where we had an infinite uh, potential value, right? The particle in the box. So in that case, the particle was in a potential where the, where the potential well, the height of the potential well went to infinity, right? And there, essentially, what we, uh, because of the infinite discontinuity, you know, we could, when we crossed these boundaries between the different regions, we could not impose that psi prime in one region was equal to psi prime in another region, right? Because they were discontinuous. Because psi was discontinuous, because uh, psi prime was discontinuous, because if psi double prime has an infinite discontinuity, then, uh, you know, psi prime is not going to be continuous. So in this region, 
for this kind of potential, we cannot, we, we did not impose something like this. But we could, but the discontinuity in Psi prime was finite. Psi prime is finite. Okay? And therefore, Psi is continuous. So that's the only thing we could, that's the only thing we could, uh, so the only boundary condition we could impose was that, that, uh, that at this point between region one and two, the two Psi were equal and Psi two was equal to Psi three in that, in this region. But whereas when we went to uh, discontinuous uh, potential, which were nonetheless finite, so for example, this guy, this is a discontinuous potential, but it's a finite discontinuity. In that case, you know, we can even, you know, this is also something because psi prime then is continuous. And therefore we can impose that, okay? Okay, sir, got it. Okay. Any other questions? These are very subtle and important uh, topics, points, so I'm glad that you asked the question. Okay, so let's dive right into the harmonic oscillator, a la Dirac. So, so the harmonic oscillator And I'll be, I'll give a bit of context this time, because I think uh, last time I just dove right into it without giving you too much context about some of the notation I was introducing. But here I will give you context. So we know that the Hamiltonian for the harmonic oscillator, well, it's a quantum particle, so it has the usual uh, kinetic term, and then it's a quadratic potential energy. Okay, where omega is a positive number. It is the frequency, the angular frequency. And m is the mass. And we saw that this Hamiltonian is positive definite. That for any psi, this is true. So this also meant that h can have only positive eigenvalues, right? So if this is the real line and this is zero, H, the eigenvalues of H can be zero to whatever. Okay, this is the allowed region we get. Now, we want to introduce some non-Hermitian operators at first sight it seems a bit mysterious because you know they are not observable and that you would be right in thinking that but they are very useful as we shall see. Okay. In some sense, these non-Hermitian operators will give you the square root of the Hamiltonian. Okay. They're, they're a little bit like of complex numbers. You see that if you have, say, um, you know, suppose that if you have a number, say, a squared plus b squared, then you can always write plus i b is a complex number, right? Times a minus i b, which is the conjugate of this number, right? So we are basically will be using that philosophy. You see, our Hamiltonian has this form, right? So it's a operator uh, analog of this uh, of this uh, idea. Okay, so let's introduce these non-Hermitian operators. The first one is a. It's m omega divided by 2h bar square root x plus i 
P divided by M of omega. And it's really this, you know, I, which makes it a non-Hermitian operator. And it's Hermitian conjugate is M omega by two H bar square root X minus I P. Okay. Now, you know, we use the fundamental in a commutation relationship. which is the X and the P operators satisfy this algebra. Okay, this algebra or it's three dimensional generalization is called the Heisenberg algebra, okay? Because Heisenberg was the first one to uh, formulate quantum mechanics in terms of an algebra of operators. So now what we can do is that we can say, okay, um, you know, what is the, what is this thing? Okay. So last time, you know, we cal calculated what this is, and this was given by one. Yeah. And, you know, this sort of uh, normalization was chosen such that it does give us one. By the way, I forgot there should be M omega here, right? One over, yeah. Okay, any questions so far? This is just a few lines of algebra, okay? So to arrive at this, we also used the fact that X commutes with itself and P commutes with itself. All operators commute with themselves, right? Itself, for themselves, yeah. Okay, so we also have, similarly, A, A. Um, I will probably forget the caret, so you'll have to um, understand which is an operator from the context, okay? So now I want to express uh, my Hamiltonian operator in terms of uh, A and A dagger, okay? So it is a very easy exercise to show that H is equal to a dagger a plus half h bar omega, okay? What we're doing here is exactly, you know, this thing. So this is a h squared. So h squared is some, you know, it's, a, it's, the, it's the operator analog of this, okay? So I want you to, you know, figure, you know, work this out yourself, okay? Show. Okay, so this is, so now it's natural to introduce a new operator N, which is this operator over here. It's just a name. And then we can express H as N plus half H bar omega. Now, H is a Hermitian operator. There is a one identity operator here. That means that N must also be a Hermitian operator, right? Do you agree? So is it like A, uh, A, uh, that, yeah, that plus sign, forgot the name. A dagger, a dagger and A are independently not Hermitian, but together they make a Hermitian operator. Yeah, and we can prove that, right? Because if yes, I sir. say what is the, is the dagger of N, well, it's A dagger A of dagger 
Now, if I take the dagger of a product of two operators, if I have say two operators A and B, if I take the dagger, that's equal to B dagger A dagger, right? So we have, here we have A dagger, A dagger, dagger, which is A dagger, A, which is M, okay? So I think you are familiar with this, but if you're not, you know, uh, what I mean is this, suppose you have psi, uh, A, B, phi, so this is equal to A, B dagger of psi of phi, right? But the yes, left sir. hand, but the left hand side is equal to, say, b dagger psi, a of phi, right? So the left hand, but this is also equal to, a dagger, b dagger, psi, of uh, phi. So if I compare this thing with this thing, I find this thing. And this is something as matrices, you, you understand that matrices also have this, right, property. It comes from the fact that when you take the transpose of two, a product of two matrices, uh, the ordering of the matrices change, okay? Anyway, any questions so far? I have a question. So yes. how did we, so the A and A dagger have a very specific form. I mean, once you yeah. define one, you define the other. But did exactly. we figure that out from what we wanted to happen in the first place? Like we wanted H uh, to be some A dagger A plus half. How did yeah, we know what the, form A was going to be? Well, but it's, it's just that you're basically taking a square root of, a, of, a, of an operator. And uh, you know that H has this very nice quadratic form, right? H has this uh, has yeah. a form which is sum of two quadratic terms, right? And if you have done some con some complex uh, numbers, you know that oh, if I have a h squared, a real number which I can write it uh, in terms of two real numbers, a squared plus b squared. Suppose I have, then you know, I know this to be true, right? So then so it's just, just a matter of knowing what A and B are supposed to be, right? Yeah, the coefficients you just adjust, right? So that, yeah. you know, those are, uh, you know, those are just like, you know, things you, yeah. Uh, Dirac was a, a master of square roots. Uh, people don't understand or don't appreciate how well he understood the notion of square root and how to generalize it to operators. This is an example. There is another example which is even more sublime, the Dirac equation. The Dirac equation, which describes the physics of electrons with spins, is actually a square root of, of sorts to the Klein-Gordon equation, okay? And, but that's a story for another day, okay? All right, so um, any other questions? Okay, so, the form of N also makes it very clear that it's a positive definite operator, meaning that all its eigenvalues are either zero or positive. That is what it means for a, an operator to be positive definite. How can we say that? Well, if I take any old state psi and I take its expectation value, then if I write psi and then this is A dagger of A of psi, and then this is a of psi, a of psi. But a of psi is some other wave function phi, phi. So this is just a norm of the wave function, norm square of the wave function phi. So which is of course greater than zero. Thus we see that the operator n is a positive definite. And since, um, and since h, is n plus half of h bar omega, all of this is positive. And we know that n is greater than or equal to zero. We can say that h is greater than or equal to half of h bar omega, right? And this is of course consistent with what we found last time where we found that 
H, the expectation value that, that H has positive definite eigenvalues. Okay. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so, so we have expressed H in terms of N, but we actually, the only thing we know about N is that it's eigen, it's Hermitian, it's Hermitian, and its eigenvalues are positive, definite, right? We don't know anything else about n. If we can find out the eigenvalue spectrum of n, then we will have the eigenvalue spectrum of h, right? Because suppose that psi of n is an eigenfunction of n, belonging to the eigenvalue small n. Small n is some positive real number. Okay, so n is an eigenvalue of n. So then uh, n plus half h bar omega is an eigenvalue of h, right? Because of this relationship, right? Because of this relationship. So if we can solve the eigenvalue problem for n, if we can solve this problem, we have solved the <coughs> problem of the harmonic oscillator. Do you agree? Yes, sir. Makes sense to me. OK, all right, awesome. Uh, all right, so now let's find out the algebra of of the harmonic oscillator. So we have, so our set of operators that we have to play with, set of operators consists of A, A dagger and N, right? So we want to find what is the algebra. So we have already found that A commutes with itself and A dagger commutes with itself by definition and a dagger and a is one this we sh showed last time so now let's look at the commutator of n and a so n of a is given by a dagger a comma a right now this we can write as a dagger commutator of A and A plus A dagger A, commutator of A dagger A and A. How did we do this? Well, we used a very useful identity. We said that if I have, say, A, B, two operators, and I take the commutator with C, then what is that? That's just A, B, C minus C, A, B. So this then I can write as a, B, C, I can subtract from it A, C, B, but, but this wasn't here. So I have to add A of C, B minus of C, A, B. And here we see that A, A is both of, is at the front, so I can keep that common. And then I have the commutator of B and C. Here we see B, B is at the end, I can keep that common, and then I have the commutator of A and C times B, okay? So this is the uh, identity I use to uh, expand the commutator between A and the product of A, A dagger to sum of commutators involving just A and A dagger, okay? That's a very useful thing to know. So if I know this then, the first term is zero because it's commutator of A with itself. The second term, A dagger A is one, right? So we just have A. So as a result, we know that 
commutator of n and a is a, right? Yes, is that sir. clear? Okay. Um, I think I made a mistake. Uh, yeah, I made a mistake. Here it is. <laughs> I fooled you all. I fooled you all. Here is the mistake. A, a dagger is what, okay? All right? Okay. Uh, uh, is it like a dagger and a are not, I mean, not, or my, I mean, or does order matter in? Yes, of course it does matter because they don't commute. Yeah, of course it does matter. Yeah. So because of this, um, what I should do here is over here, I should get a minus sign. I should get a minus sign. And here, I'll get a minus sign. Okay, any questions? Do you want me to, uh, I think I did derive it last time, so, and it's very easy to do, so. so. And then, you know, we want to know how N, what is the commutator of N and A dagger, right? So here we can do exactly the same analysis again. Or what we can say is that, okay, let me just take that Hermitian conjugate of this thing. Now, if I take the Hermitian conjugate of this thing, the right-hand side, I get minus A dagger. On the left-hand side, because the taking the, the Hermitian conjugate reverses the ordering, what we get here is we get N A dagger with the minus sign because the commutator has a minus sign in it, right? And therefore, we get from here, in a dagger is plus a dagger. So let me just call that number one. And number two is n of a is minus of a. So these are our very important commutation relationship, okay? That we're going to be using in solving the eigenvalue spectrum of the N. Okay, any questions? Okay, so, <clears throat> so let's uh, solve the eigenvalue problem. So, you know, let psi n be an eigenfunction of n, you know, belonging to the eigenvalue small n. So at this point, all we know about small n is that it's a positive real number, right? We don't know anything else. So, so this statement means n acting on psi n gives me small n psi n, okay? Now what if I apply the A operator on psi n? I get a new state, right? Now, I asked the question, what is the n eigenvalue of this new state? So to do this, we apply n on this guy. But from this algebra, from this algebra, we see that if I want to commute n and a, I can do that. But the price I have to pay is, I have to introduce a new term, with a minus sign with A of psi n. And then here we can use the fact that it is an eigenfunction of n with eigenvalue small n to write this as A small n 
psi n minus a psi n. But a is an operator, n is just a number. So I can commute to those two. So I can factor out n minus one, and then I have a of psi n. So what is this equation telling me? This equation is telling me that when I act by a on psi n, when I act by a on psi n, its eigenvalue, the resulting state, has an eigenvalue which is one less than the eigenvalue of the original state that I started with, right? <coughs> okay. Yes, sir, it should be the same with a dagger as well. Yeah, so, so that means that I can say a acting on psi n must be proportional and let me put a proportionality constant here and let's call me call it c n minus one. It's a constant of proportionality. So this must be proportional to psi n minus one. This is some constant of proportional proportionality, right? Okay, is this clear? This is the single most important thing to understand. The, what the effect of A is. The effect of A is to lower the eigenvalue. Is to jump from one eigenfunction to another eigenfunction whose eigenvalue is one less. All right? Okay, so similarly, if I now work out what a dagger of psi n, what the effect of this is going to be, if I apply n, what do you think I should get from the right-hand side? Can you guess? n minus 1 a dagger psi n. That's what we got before, right? Yes, sir. But if I have dagger, should I get the same uh, thing? We're going to get n plus 1. Right. The n plus 1 of a dagger psi of n. And this plus 1 is related to the fact that the sign here is plus. And the minus 1 was related to the fact that the sign here is minus. Okay, so that means that a dagger acting on psi n gives me up to a proportionality constant, let's call it dn plus one, psi of n plus one. This is a constant of proportionality. Okay. Any questions? Uh, psi n minus one and psi n plus one, are these two uh, different eigenstates, eigenfunctions? Yes. Well, if, if psi n is, is, if the n is fixed, yes, they're different. If, su suppose you start with psi three, one is psi two, the other one is psi four. Right, they're different states. Okay. 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 So let, let's make an observation. And the observation is that a dagger raises the I get the n eigenvalue. an eigenvalue and a uh, lowers the n eigenvalue. As a result, these guys have a name, 
have names. This is known as the raising operator. In quantum field theory, this is known as the creation operator. Okay. And A is known as the lowering operator. And in quantum field theory, this is known as the um, annihilation operator. But, you know, that's not what we're going to use. And together, they are known as ladder operators. Sometimes also known as stepping operators. They have various things. All kind of means the same thing. Okay? So it's very important for us to determine CND. these constants of proportionality, okay? So because these, of these states belong to, so states belong, belonging to different eigenvalues of n are orthogonal, right? We know that. We proved that, right? Okay, if I ask you to prove this, can you, can you do this? Yes sir. yes, sir. Okay, very good. Okay. So we're going to use this. So then let's, you know, let's consider the inner product between A acting on psi n with itself. And then what are we going to get is that we are going to get Cn minus 1 mod squared, right? Times psi n minus 1, psi n minus 1, right? So the right-hand side is going to be c n minus 1 squared times 1 because of the ortho of, of this property, right? But on the left-hand side, I can write this as a dagger of a psi n psi n. I've just taken this guy over here. But this thing is nothing but n. So from this guy, I, I get n psi n psi n is equal to c n minus 1 squared. But this thing is just 1. So therefore, I have c n minus 1 mod squared is n. And I can choose the phase. The phase cannot be determined. So let me just choose the phase. It's conventional to choose a real phase. So we say Cn minus 1 is square root of n, OK? And therefore, C of n is square root of n plus 1, OK? So here we have determined Cn. So similarly, to find out D, uh, I just say, okay, let's just take a dagger of psi n, a dagger of psi n, and on the right-hand side, I will get mod of dn plus 1 mod squared psi of n plus 1, psi of n plus 1. And just by doing the same manipulation, we can find that dn plus 1 can be chosen to be x square root of n plus 1, okay? so. This is C and this is D, okay? All right, is that clear? Yes, sir. All right, so now what if I start, pick a state and keep applying the lowering operator, okay? So, Suppose I start with psi of n and I apply on it a. Then according to our formula, this should be square root of n 
psi of n minus one, right? If I go back, remember, if I go back, a acting on psi of n gives me psi n minus one and c n minus one. And we found out c n minus one was square root of n. So this is what, what I've written here. Okay. Now if I apply the same, another lowering operator on the same equation, on the same guy, so I get two factors of a. So now this is just a number, so this just stays as it is. And then I get another number, which is n minus one, and then psi of n minus two, right? And similarly, if I apply a some integer number of times, say m on psi of n, then I will have n times n minus one dot 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 n minus m plus one square root times psi of n minus m. Do you agree? Yes, sir. But you see that uh, this process cannot go on forever because we know that the eigenvalue, the n eigenvalue has a lower limit, right? It cannot, because if, if this process could go forever, then at some point we would hit the negative numbers, right? Okay? Yes, sir. Okay, so just let me just write that. This process cannot continue uh, indefinitely. You know, um, for otherwise, psi n could uh, otherwise, sorry. N would have negative eigenvalues, which we know is not true. Right? So, how can we avoid this? We can avoid this if, for some, for a given N, there is a M such that this is, this goes to zero, right? Right? But that can only happen, m is an integer. That can only happen if n is also an integer, right? So, you know, so this, you know, so, so there must exist. So, you know, there must exist some integer, say m prime, such that a raised to the power m prime acting on psi n is zero. Okay. So does the eigenfunction become zero or the inside the root something happens? And it goes to zero. Uh, there, uh, something goes, yeah, that the root goes to zero, uh, but that okay, I see what you okay. so what you're saying is that. You know, at some point, does this go to zero? But this doesn't go to zero, right? Yes. So my question was, which part goes to zero? Uh, both, actually. Because if this goes to zero, then... Um,
I mean, the multiplying terms should get one zero inside somehow. Right. So, so okay. So yeah. So suppose that this goes to zero, right? So now, if you apply more lowering operator, you're actually not going to get anything else, right? So, in some sense, you know, there, you know, there might be functions, but you know, it's not an eigenfunction. It's, it's not something you can reach by this process. Okay. Okay. So, you know, uh, yeah. So if the, the idea is that because at some point, you know, the eigenvalue, this eigenvalue has to go to zero, right? Yes, sir. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so, and that will only happen if uh, just one second. Yeah. Okay, so, so what does this tell us? That the n are also n can only be integers, right? A positive integers. N can only be zero. One, two, three, dot, dot. So n cannot be, say, half an integer. Okay, n can, n can be, because otherwise, you know, this thing will never, never terminate. Okay, and we, we will have, um, you know, we will have wave function with negative eigenvalues, you know, which we cannot have. Okay. It's like it's a it's a it's a recursion relationship of sort, right? So if you have, you know, if you suppose that you you know about the gamma function, right? So the gamma function has a re recursion relationship, which is uh, what was it? It's um, n times n minus one equals to. Can do you remember what what exactly it is? It's a factorial, right? So we should be able to do this. So. Um, no, I think it's the other way. Yeah. So, uh, do you remember factorial of n is what? Gamma I think it's of? gamma of n plus one equals n gamma n. Uh, okay, Saif, can you tell me again? Ga gamma of n plus one is uh, n yeah. into gamma of n. Into n is gamma of n or the other way around? It's uh, gamma of n plus one is equal to n into gamma of n. Okay, yeah. So this is it. Yeah. Right. So it's a bit like that, right? So you know, if if I know, if I know what this, if I know what this is, and I know that this is not zero, then for that equation to make sense, this must be non-zero, right? So. Yes. Similarly, uh, you know, this thing, you know, I mean, this is a non-zero um, operator. This is a non-zero wave function. And if this didn't go to zero, then this cannot be zero, right? So that means that this thing must exist. So, so if this, if the right-hand side is, go, is to go to zero, that means that this must go to zero. Okay, so we have some observation. We've actually solved the whole problem. Okay, so here are our conclusions. Number one is that n of psi of n, n of psi of n is, means n must be zero, one, two, dot, dot, dot. Okay, it has no upper limit. Because if you, you, you know, if there is no, uh, there is no constraint uh, from the positive definite quantity, right? Uh, in when we uh, look at um, um, when we look at uh, angular momentum, we will find something very similar. There, there will be a, both a lower limit and an upper limit. The same with. Uh, 
uh, the same with Clifford algebra, which Mian was saying. Actually, the angular momentum algebra is Clifford algebra in disguise and vice versa. Okay, so this is something very interesting that maybe someday you will learn. Okay, number two is that, okay, A dagger is the raising operator. So what it does is that it raises, it, it jumps from, it takes psi n to psi n plus one. And A is the lowering operator, okay? And uh, number three, the eigenvalue spectrum of the Hamiltonian H is then E of N is a one half H bar omega, three halves H bar omega, five halves H bar omega. So this is the vacuum energy, okay? So, of course, we saw the same result in the previous lecture, right? But here it arose from a very different analysis. Okay? So, as I said before, you know, this is, um, if I look at the potential, uh, intermolecular potential, say, in a solid, then it looks something like this, right? Uh, it looks something like this. Um, maybe the R is, the zero is here. I don't really care about that. And you know, in this region, uh, this looks like, okay, this is not a very good drawing, but near the minima, the potential looks quadratic and the spacing of the energy levels near the minima are all equidistant, okay? The distance between two consecutive energy level is h bar omega and therefore ignoring the zero point energy energy of the oscillators is n h bar omega right which is the Planck hypothesis okay and graphically what we have done here for the harmonic oscillator is that we have a uh, you know energy level e0 and then we have an infinite number of energy levels, E1, E2, sorry, it's not very straight, E3, E4, and the raising operators take you in that direction. Okay. So is it like oscillating in uh, energy space? Uh, what do you mean uh, oscillating? No, I mean, this is basically mathematically what the raising operators do, okay? Oh, okay. The, the lowering operators take you in that direction. Okay. I was talking about the uh, approximated quadratic graph. And... Oh, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, we can think of the photon, the Einstein relationship for the energy of the photon of E equals to H bar omega, right? So the process in which a harmonic oscillator, you know, jumps from, say, an atom jumps from, if, so if you think of the, the, the atom as a harmonic oscillator for the low lying state, then these jump, we can think of them as the, the atom absorbing a photon, right? Of H bar omega. And the, and the jump down you know, to a lower level, we can think of an emission of an atom, um, uh, emission of a photon of H bar omega, okay? So this is why we call, you know, uh, in quantum field theory, A and A dagger are called uh, uh, you know, creation and annihilation operators because what they do is that they create or annihilate a quanta of uh, of photon. Okay. 
Any other questions? Before we move on to uh, the wave functions. This is a super elegant way of solving the problem. Unfortunately, it can't really be, you can't really use this to solve exactly more complicated problems, but it, it does give a handle uh, in perturbation theory as well. Okay. Okay, so let's look at the vacuum state. Okay, the vacuum state. So the vacuum state, psi zero is the lowest energy state. H acting on that gives me half H bar omega psi zero. Okay, so I want to find out what the wave function is. So usually when we have to find out the wave function, we have to solve the Schrodinger equation, right? It's a second order differential equation. But here we can actually do a more clever thing. We know that A acting on psi zero is going to give me what? Cn minus one psi minus one. So this is the annihilation operator and this is the vacuum state. So what should I get? Zero. Exactly, right? Now what is A? A, remember, was m omega by 2h bar square root. And then we had x minus i by m omega p. OK, so this is what the definition of a was. So if I express a in, the, in, in my coordinate uh, representation, and these are just constants, so they remain as they are. In my coordinate representation, the, the position operator is nothing but just the number x minus i by m of omega. But what is the p operator? The p operator is h bar by i d by dx, right? So, so this equation then becomes a psi naught equals to zero is nothing but x plus some constant, let's call it x zero squared d by dx acting on psi zero of x. You know that this constant is going to have the dimension of, of length squared because this has dimension of length and the derivative has dimension of inverse of length, right? And you know, you can show that x zero squared is nothing but h bar squared by m omega, okay? So this is a first order differential equation, okay? So we are saved from saving, from solving a second order differential equation in this method, okay? So this equation is very easy to solve. Let's do that. So this equation is D of psi naught is minus X by X naught D of X or psi naught is some constant E to the power minus X squared divided by two X naught squared. It's a Gaussian. Okay. So of course we can uh, normalize the Gaussian then C is going to be this value, okay? So the, so the, <clears throat> you know, this is something we saw last time, right? The, uh, the, the ground state is a Gaussian and here we see it comes out very, very easily. Okay? And then we can, okay. And you know what A dagger is? A dagger is just going to be you know, uh, this this thing, so let me just uh, copy and paste. Let me take this down below. And, uh, okay, 
So a dagger is just going to be, if I take dagger here, this is just going to become, uh, this is going to become a minus i, and this is going to become a plus i, right? So, um, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, this is not the way to do this, sorry. Uh, this remains, this just becomes plus i, because this is actually a Hermitian operator. We don't mess with its sign, okay? The, the better way to do it is to actually first say, okay, here we have a position operator, a momentum operator, P, which is Hermitian, and then we write, okay, M of omega to H bar square root of M X plus I by M omega, and then here we have H bar by I D by DX, okay? So, so why did I bring this up? Because now if you take A dagger, and you just apply it on psi zero. If then you get psi one. A dagger of psi zero just gives you psi one. And this just gives you one over square root of two x naught x minus x naught squared d by dx acting on psi zero. And you know, you can just work this out. I'm not gonna, you know, you, you get the answer that you that you expect. And you can find a, a neat formula for the nth state, and this is given by, it's a bit of mathematics, and you know, I'm not gonna make you do this, but uh, when we were kids in Dhaka University, we had to derive these, all this crap. So x naught n plus half, um, x minus x naught squared, d by dx to the power n, e to the power minus half x by x naught whole square. Yeah, it's, it's kind of the generating function. Uh, you can derive this formula from the generating function. And you can also then express it in terms of the Hermit polynomial. Anyway, I'm not gonna be um, going into that and you know, you can, derived del x del p is greater or equal to h bar by two. And because the ground state is a Gaussian, you can show that that state actually saturates the bound. Okay? Okay, I think uh, this kind of concludes this course. Um, and for those who were late, I wanted to tell you that I haven't posted all the lectures yet. so. Uh, let me just postpone the last quiz by a few days and let me keep on posting lectures and then I can let you know, you know, because the quiz can just, you know, happen even on the 10th or the 11th, right? Or whenever it's convenient for you. Okay, any questions? Or any feedback on the course? I think you you probably have to give some formal on feedback, the part, but you can all, yeah. Oh, on the part where you, uh, a psi zero is a psi zero is equal to zero. You wrote something like that. Could you please explain why is that zero? Oh, because a is the annihilation operator, right? And psi zero is the is the is the state with the lowest eigenvalue. Oh, okay, got it. Right. So that's why it's, it's a lowering operator. So. Yeah. Okay. All right, any questions or comments? Okay, if you need anything, please reach out to me. I am always here and I'll stop the recording. Okay. If you, 